preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening again. My name is John Ruskay. I serve as Director of Education here at the Y. I want to welcome you to this, the third week of A Lens on America Political Perspectives, this three-week film festival. We think it should be an extraordinary week with Ruby D among the speakers, as well as Michael and Robert Mirapol and Charles Morgan Jr. on Thursday evening. And I hope those of you that are festival pass holders or those of you that are here for the first time will join us uh, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evening for the concluding evenings of this series. <clears throat> as you entered the hall, um, we handed you a small little library of brochures they contain selected 1982-1983 lecture series, ones which we think you may find of particular interest. I would hope that you would take a look at them, take them home. Uh, of particular interest might be those series on human rights. There's another series on constitutional rights, one which is being presented in cooperation with the New York Civil Liberties Union, as well as a major series on reviving the American economy with four of the leading economic thinkers in this country joining us during next year. I do hope you'll enjoy this evening and come back and participate in our other lecture programs. To introduce this evening's film and our speaker, one of our moderators, Annette Insdorf. Good evening. Judgment at Nuremberg was directed in 1961 by Stanley Kramer, but it was not the first time that the Nuremberg trials had been fictionalized. It already appeared in 1959 on Playhouse 90, uh, Judgment at Nuremberg, directed by George Roy Hill and starring Claude Rains and Maximilian Schell. Although the film that you're about to see contains some documentary footage, it is a fictional reconstruction, and it's very much in keeping with Hollywood conventions of the 50s and 60s in terms of star casting, in terms of music, and in terms of translating historical issues into confrontations of personality. Our guest speaker tonight, Telford Taylor, will be able to illuminate for us after the film how much of Judgment at Nuremberg is faithful to Nuremberg and how much to Hollywood, for he was the chief US prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials. Those of you who saw the last hurrah here two weeks ago will probably rejoice in finding Spencer Tracy starring again, this time as the crusty main judge who is brought to Nuremberg. The other actors are no less impressive. This film is definitely an all-star movie, relying upon the unique personas of Maximilian Schell, of Richard Widmark, of Judy Garland, of Montgomery Clift, and of Burt Lancaster. We're very sorry for a slight interruption that will take place about 50 minutes into the screening for a change of projectors. It should take no more than about 50 or 60 seconds, and we ask you to bear with us. So although Judgment at Nuremberg is an emotional dramatization, it does raise important questions about responsibility, individual, national, and universal, which we'll talk about later with Telford Taylor. Thank you and enjoy the film. The, um, is this on now? Yeah. The rich career of our speaker tonight, Telford Taylor, has numerous facets. He has been an attorney, both public and private, a professor, as he was professor of law at Columbia University from 1962 to 76, author, author of eight books, including Nuremberg and Vietnam in 1970, and Munich, The Price of Peace, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award in 1979. He's been a distinguished officer in the US Army, where he rose from military intelligence officer to US Chief of Counsel for War Crimes. He has been decorated not only by the United States, but by the Order of the British Empire, by the French Légion d'Honneur, by the Polonia Restituta of Poland, and that just th there are quite a few others that I won't go into now. But we're very proud to have with us tonight Telford Taylor. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. 
I'd like, first of all, to ask you about the factual background of the Nuremberg trials, the degree to which this film has a real frame of reference or merely a Hollywood frame of reference. Well, I think perhaps the uh, most helpful thing I can do is to give a little uh, additional background about first the trial itself and then the, uh, uh, the moving picture which you've seen. Uh, I know that lots of you uh, weren't on this earth when Nuremberg took place. It's a long time ago, and some of you were very young. And the ordinary picture of Nuremberg, the thing that people think about is, well, the Russians were on the court and the the most notorious uh, Nazi leaders, uh, Goering and Ribbentrop and so forth, were the defendants, and of course you saw none of them there, which may introduce an element of confusion. Uh, the answer which is very simple, uh, there were in fact 13 Nuremberg trials, and there is quite a difference between the first one and the 12 that came after. Uh, the first Nuremberg trial had uh, judges from Russia, France, England, and the United States, and prosecutors from each of those four countries. Uh, the American chief prosecutor was Robert H. Jackson, who was on leave from the Supreme Court for it. There were those who wanted another international trial of that sort, but that didn't come off, and the result was that there were, after that, a series of trials in the individual occupation zones, and there were 12 trials in the American zone, and I was the chief counsel for those trials. There were, for example, two military trials, two trials of SS leaders, trial of doctors, et cetera, et cetera. And there was this trial of judges, which is the basis of the movie that you've seen. Uh, now, the, uh, Ms. Insdorf told you before it that this is really a second edition. Uh, preceding this, there was a Playhouse 90 uh, television movie, also called Judgment at Nuremberg, uh, that came about because uh, Herbert Brodkin, who was then running Playhouse 90, decided to have a play about, a, a television play about Nuremberg, and he retained Abby Mann uh, to write the script for it. Uh, and then he came to me, I had known him at Fire Island, I guess, and, and he suggested that I act as consultant on the television play, and I did. And I gave Abby Mann more books and records than he could read, but he read a lot of them, and he was the one who decided upon this trial of the judges uh, as the focal point for what he then proceeded to write. As he was writing it, some problems developed, and uh, Herbert Brodkin at that point uh, uh, took on George Roy Hill to be the director of the television play. Uh, and we all went out to Hollywood, my one appearance there in that kind of a role, uh, and, uh, and that was uh, this this uh, television play was the result. The only actor that you saw tonight who was also in the television play was Maximilian Schell, who plays the German defense counsel in both. Uh, the judge in the television play was Claude Rains. Uh, the, part, uh, the part of, the, of uh, Ernst Janin uh, was taken by Paul Lucas, uh, and the, um, uh, the uh, chief prosecutor was Melvin Douglas. Uh, now, after that, Abby Mann made these arrangements with Stanley Kramer to produce the movie. Uh, I had no part in that. Uh, and now let me come to a few of the differences. Uh, let me uh, mention to begin with that there is a great deal about this movie that is authentic, very authentic, in the sense that a large part <clears throat> of what's said in court is lifted directly from the record of this trial which was called United States against Alstutter. Uh, of course, there are some differences that really don't have any significance. There were 14 defendants instead of four. Various other differences of that kind, but these aren't meaningful. I would like to bring out three differences, though, that I think you should have in mind uh, in connection with the questions that may be put to me, either by Ms. Instor or by some of you. Uh, in the first place, as you see, the, uh, there's sort of a god from the machine uh, that ends this because uh, Ernst Janning gets up and says, yes, I was guilty. I just wanted to say at the outset that nothing like that happened at Nuremberg. <laughs> Nobody did that. Uh, and this was a feature both of the television play and of the movie. I am not saying that was necessarily wrong. It certainly has its dramatic appeal, and many of the things said by Ernst Janning uh, were indeed, I think, things that needed to be said. But as representative of the way the trials at Nuremberg came out, uh, that is not to be taken 
uh, as uh, representative. Indeed, it, had, it has no precedent. Now, secondly, there are a couple of people in the movie that were not in Nuremberg. Marlene Dietrich was not in Nuremberg. <laughs> I'm not reciting that necessarily as a plus, uh, but looking at this again as uh, a study, this seems to me uh, a feature of it which uh, is less than a plus. It's not that she didn't act well, that she wasn't very attractive, all that is true. Also, she is modeled actually on the widow of General Yodel, who was one of the defendants in the first Nuremberg trial, and she did indeed wage and for many years, a very courageous uh, campaign to try to get his name cleared. She is the model of the part. But what, of course, is quite off key about it is that I think no judge would, short of somebody very close to a corrupt judge, uh, would have allowed himself to talk or to be talked to about the case by the widow of a prior defendant who had been convicted and who obviously was intending to influence his decision. Perhaps some judges would, but certainly not a judge of the integrity and strength of character that uh, Spencer Tracy was portraying. And I think I could say without fear of, of cavil that, uh, that although the judges in Nuremberg were of varying calibers, some were widows, some uh, widowers, some had families with them, some didn't, some of them may have friends I'm sure that none of them had a friend of that particular kind who was trying to influence the vote with as much charm to bring about on it. That, again, is a thing which would be quite uncharacteristic of the, uh, of the judicial system, except at its lowest uh, recesses. <laughs> Perhaps more important is that there was no one-star general there who was leaning on the prosecutor to go easy. I say this with some feeling, for although I was not the chief prosecutor in that particular case, I was in charge of that among the other cases that followed the first trial. The actual chief prosecutor was Charles La Follette, uh, an ex-congressman and a very able lawyer, uh, who did a very fine job in prosecuting the case. Uh, I am not saying that there were not people in the zone of occupation in 1948 and 1949 who felt the way that general expressed himself, and who would have liked to bring the trials to a rapid end. Those sentiments were very much afloat in the zone, especially after the, uh, uh, the Soviet takeover in Czechoslovakia and the Berlin airlift. Both of those things did indeed come toward the end of the trial, uh, but uh, uh, the, the uh, military governor, the, the uh, commander of the occupation, was General Lucius Clay, who was throughout a very strong supporter of the trial, uh, if anybody had come and leaned on me that way, uh, I would have had nothing to do except to call General Clay, and I could be quite sure that whoever had done it would be rusticated pretty rapidly. No such pressures were got to, brought to bear. Uh, and it has always seemed to me too bad that uh, uh, the movie gives the impression that these influences did play a part in the handling of the prosecution. I hasten to add, of course, that, uh, th that uh, it, it is not untrue in the sense that it is unrepresentative of many feelings which the uh, takeover in Czechoslovakia and the airless stimulated. But in terms of their impact on the prosecution, there was no such general and there was no such pressure. I guess, uh, just to finish up with one last slight detail that sort of typified the, uh, uh, the tension that I began to feel with uh, Abby Mann's handling of the script. You may have noticed the last thing on the stage there spoke about how nobody being still in jail. Uh, it, it was a fact, of course, and it still is to this very day that Rudolf Hess is still in jail there. Well, I suppose I'm sticky and stuffy for accuracy, uh, but it did seem to me it was overstating it a bit. Uh, there are many other things that I could go into, but I think that's enough to say by way of general background. Thank you. Having been the uh, US prosecutor yourself, how do you feel watching the character of Lawson, the Richard Widmar character, this sort of histrionics, the kind of obsessive battering of the uh, witnesses. Do, do you feel discomfort when seeing that, or do you accept it as a Hollywood convention? Is he supposed to be you? I think you're right. Well, he is supposed to be me, yes. 
And I guess to put it quite simply, I was much happier with a Melvin Douglas portrayal than with a Richard Widmark portrayal. <laughs> But I, I mustn't leave it at that, because uh, if I can use a mu musical simile, you mentioned that this was in the spirit of the 60s with confrontations and a good deal of loud shouting. There wasn't a lot of loud shouting. It was done, the trials were, were conducted in a low-key way. There was no jury, of course, and that sort of shouting in front of judges, generally speaking, is counterproductive. Uh, so it was all much lower keyed than that. Uh, but. Uh, I really can't say that, uh, that, I, that I hold it against the, the direction of the film. It was in the temper of the times. If I can use a musical parallel, it was much more like Paderewski playing the piano than Alfred Brendel. <laughs> you appeared in a documentary that I find to be one of the most significant films ever made about World War II. That's Marcel Ophel's film, The Memory of Justice, from 1976. In that film, first of all, you told a story that I think is absolutely crucial to an understanding of the degree to which a film or a television program today can convey history with authenticity or can probe it with any kind of real feeling. It was about the Pacific Gas Company. And I was wondering if you might perhaps recount that, and, and that leads to my question. Do you believe that a film like this does have value as a historical document, not merely an entertaining film, or, or is it a documentary like Memory of Justice more effective or the only way to deal with these questions? It's the old question of, uh, of presenting a thing in a way which satisfies the creator as being authentic or doing it in a way which will carry a reasonable dose of authenticity and also bring in many people to see it. There's no doubt that in terms of, of spread of feeling about this that uh, something like this move, motion picture uh, is much more widely viewed than the creations of Marcel Ophels. Uh, you mentioned the Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, that's really another question. That's, that's a matter of pressures on, uh, on producers, whether of plays or movies or television shows. Uh, and it is worth telling. It's become sort of a classic case in the, uh, in the uh, study of advertiser pressure. Uh, this had to do not with the movie, but with the, the television show. Uh, when we were out in Los Angeles, in, in Hollywood, uh, uh, you saw the documentary part of the concentration camps, uh, and the, you, you heard Oswald Pohl talking about turning the gas into the, uh, into the chambers where the mass executions took place. Uh, one of the sponsors of the program uh, in, uh, on CBS was the Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Uh, and uh, they uh, immediately took fright uh, by this most unfriendly reference to gas uh, that occurs at that point. Uh, and they came to uh, Mr. DeChapa, who is the head of CBS on the coast there, and urged him to suppress all mention of gas. Well, of course, it did seem very absurd. And uh, Mr. Brodkin and DeChapa and everybody else said no, that they wouldn't have anything to do with any such uh, silly business as that. So the actors went ahead, and, and, and the, uh, the documentary extract went ahead on the basis it would be the awful word would be said. Uh, but when I viewed it on television, uh, as it, of course, we taped it, and then it was shown almost immediately thereafter. And as it was shown actually on the tube, uh, the minute the word gas was about to happen and we were leaning forward like that, uh, the noise track faded and nobody said the word gas. It picked up again right afterwards. Well, uh, I, uh, I could understand a little better the strong feelings of Pacific Gas and Electric about this, though it's rather a macabre a note that I have to strike here because actually Pacific Gas and Electric, in order to encourage the greater use of gas, uh, had been saying in its commercials, there's nothing you can't cook with gas. <laughs> and this did, as I, I say, put a rather uh, macabre turn to the whole story. Sorry you brought it up? 
No, no, I think it's important, particularly because in dealing with films like Judgment at Nuremberg, I think we can't forget related films like Holocaust and Playing for Time, which were made for television, which were presented in a televised format that included commercial interruptions and have to be appreciated within that context. In fact, Herbert Brodkin, who produced Judgment at Nuremberg on Playhouse 90, also produced Holocaust and also produced Skokie. So I think these are you know, things that have to be considered when we evaluate films that are made about such controversial and provocative subjects as World War II. Um, but let me turn this over now to some questions from the audience, not, not comments, but questions for Telford Taylor. Uh, yes? I'll repeat the question. The character played by Judy Garland, Irene Hoffman, was that typical of the German people who did not want to testify? Certainly, as time went on, between 1945, when the trials began, and 1949, when they ended, uh, there was uh, some increasing reluctance, but it was not very marked. I don't think either side had great difficulty in getting witnesses to come. Uh, actually, I think the film exaggerates a good deal the extent to which uh, the German people were paying attention to what was going on at Nuremberg. You must bear in mind that between 45 and 48, uh, Germany economically was uh, flat on its back, that everybody was more worried about getting a roof over their heads and something in their mouths uh, than anything else. And it wasn't until 48 and 49 that you began to get a measure of economic recovery. Uh, so that essentially the German people had very little strength or fiber to deal with these questions of guilt and responsibility during the main period that the trials were going on. Since you brought up Julie Garland, I, I should add, however, in the part she played there, uh, that uh, there is no more authentic part of the movie than that. Uh, the questions put to her, uh, both by the, uh, by the colonel prosecuting and by, by Herr Wolf, uh, are lifted almost verbatim from the actual transcript of the trial. There was exactly such an episode. It was called the Katzenberger case. Uh, one of the defendants in the actual trial was a judge named Rotaug, who had indeed been the presiding judge at her case. And uh, the, the girl, Irene Seiler was her real name, did come and testify in precisely the words that you heard on the screen. This question refers to a point raised by the German prosecutor um, about responsibility. Is there any parallel possible to draw between this film and the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by the Americans? Is that it? It's a question which is hard to answer as briefly as, uh, uh, as I'd like to. Uh, there is one, I think, very important difference. Uh, I don't think one could credibly argue that the uh, that the persecution and extermination of the Jews, and indeed of many of the other races, which uh, were carried on by the Germans during the war, were carried on primarily as a means of winning the war. I mean, nobody could tell me that if Russia had surrendered that the Germans would have stopped killing Jews. Uh, the killing of Jews was not a means of winning a war, but a goal to be achieved. Uh, and. Uh, by victory, it would have been all the more. It was not a war measure in the sense of a military measure at all. Whereas with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, at least nobody kept on dropping bombs after the war ended victoriously. So if one looks at that from the standpoint of military necessity, I don't think the two things are at all comparable. Uh, beyond that, uh, we get into a very vexed area. Uh, are we talking in terms of war crimes literally, or are we talking in terms of moral values? Uh, the debate about Hiroshima and Nagasaki is uh, by now an old one. Many people much wiser than I have expressed their views on it. Uh, it has always seemed to me, and I said in that little book, Nuremberg and Vietnam, that uh, Ms. Insdorf mentioned, uh, that while I could understand, though I might or might not agree with, the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima, 
the arguments in favor of it were strong. Uh, it may well be that by utilitarian ethic, in terms of life and death, that lives, many lives, were saved by a rapid ending of the war. There's another side to it. There's a strong school of thought that the war could have been ended without it about as quickly. Those are things that are, that are hard, to, uh, hard to weigh. It has always seemed to me very debatable that there is any legitimate excuse for Nagasaki after the first bomb had been dropped. Uh, it is said, of course, that we wanted to show the Japanese we could drop two, but it seems to me that was an, an, uh, a very exorbitant price to pay for a little additional proof. And I have uh, myself gone so far as to say it seems to me that it came very close to being a war crime, if by a war crime you mean uh, that you are doing something that causes a great deal of death and suffering, which is very far removed from being necessary for a military end. That's the best answer I can give you. Sir, in the middle. Who was the Maximilian Schell. What happened to the German defense attorney? Well, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the actual trial of the judges had 14 defendants, not four. That's one of those discrepancies which really doesn't make any difference from a uh, philosophical or moral standpoint. Uh, but, uh, of course, with 14 lawyers there, there was no one lawyer in that trial that dominated the scene the way Shell did in, the, uh, <clears throat> in both the movie and the play. Uh, and, uh, of course, there was actually no Ernst Jannings. There were comparable characters there. The, the leading defendant in the case was a man named Schlegelberger, who had been the Minister of Justice and was something of a scholar. But he didn't op occupy anything like the uh, eminence that uh, Emil Jannings was supposed to have occupied. I should add that I think that also was a note which was not really accurate. The Germans don't think much of lawyers. Indeed, the continent generally doesn't. Lawyers don't command at all the the prestige, either as judges or practitioners, that they do here or in England. Uh, and it was really a false note that, to picture uh, Ernst Janning as telling Hitler off that way. Uh, this would, would never have happened, and, and he would probably not have been in Hitler's presence at all, because uh, as Minister of Justice, as a judge sitting in these trials, he was comparatively no account by German standards. Goering, when he was uh, asked who he wanted as a lawyer, said, well, I didn't know many lawyers. Seems to me there was this guy who was a student of mine at school. I said he became a lawyer. Get him. It was just that casual. We have time for about one or two more questions. Uh, yes, please. Can you explain on what basis the Germans were convicted and sentenced to life in prison and later released? On what basis were the Germans who were convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment later released? You would have to ask somebody else that question. Uh, the sequence of events was that uh, just about the time the trials ended, the military uh, occupation gave way to a civilian, uh, a civilian uh, administration. Uh, General Clay was replaced by Mr. McCloy, who was the civilian administrator and am later ambassador to, to West Germany. Uh, he was asked or decided to uh, to review for clemency purposes the sentences that had been passed at Nuremberg. Uh, initially, uh, Judge David Peck, who sat on the bench here for many years in the appellate division, wrote a report to Mr. McCloy making various recommendations for clemency. Uh, and Mr. McCloy subsequently came out with uh, certain decisions, uh, reducing sentences, uh, uh, some of which resulted in immediate release of the defendants, others were greatly reduced. And it is true that within, uh, I don't know whether it would have been exactly five years, but within relatively few years, uh, all of the defendants who were in Landsberg jail were out. Uh, and of the Nuremberg defendants, the only one who remained there a long time, and he's still there, is Rudolf Hess. Jews who were witnesses, they 
Did you have a question in the back? It, it related to this, you know, okay. Uh, just that briefly that um, the question of homosexual uh, movements in the 20s and 30s was raised, that the Nazis uh, made a point of exterminating homosexuals as well. Were there ever, was there ever mention of this in the trials uh, where there were Jews as witnesses, were there homosexuals as witnesses? Of course, on this score, there were Nazis and Nazis, a very different uh, persuasion on this. And as you may or may not know, the uh, uh, so-called uh, purge in 1934 uh, was largely for the purpose uh, of Ernst Röhm uh, and his followers, uh, was said to be, uh, uh, have taken place partly for the purpose you suggest, eliminating homosexuality in the, in the government. Uh, I do not believe myself that that was the motivating factor for that particular episode. I think it was political much more than moral. And as far as the uh, Nuremberg uh, experience is concerned, the uh, uh, that issue I cannot recall coming up at the time. You would have to also bear in mind that in 1945 to 48, uh, that uh, matter uh, was not discussed nearly as freely as it is today. Uh, so that uh, I suppose there would have been more tendency to try to push it under the rug than there would be today when people would uh, think nothing of discuss discussing it quite frankly and freely. All I can say is that I don't remember the matter coming up at Nuremberg at all, and I don't think I can recall any particular documentation relating to it that's in the files. Yes. The question is about the application of the Nuremberg criteria to other events in the world, specifically that Mr. Telford was involved in controversial questions during the Vietnam War, and uh, can the principles be applied to that or to current events in the Middle East? Or Thank you, Miss Anne. My last name is Telford. <laughs> Taylor. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Taylor. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> Of course, the book that I, that, that I wrote during the Vietnam War was directed to that precise issue. Uh, Justice Jackson, when he was presenting the, the case in the first Nuremberg trial, uh, used the famous phrase, to put a poison chalice to the defendant's lips is to put it to our own lips as well. In other words, that, uh, uh, that uh, if these principles are to be of any value, they must apply generally and apply to us as well as others. And it was precisely because of that that it seemed to me in the Vietnam War that <clears throat> when I wrote the book, the time had come to try to make some kind of uh, analysis of, uh, of exactly that. But of course, the Vietnam War, terrible as it was, is only one of a great many wars that have intervened between World War II and the present time. Uh, some of these wars uh, are sort of echoes of World War I, like the Falkland Islands. Uh, where, as far as I know, there have been very little complaint of atrocities on either side, except insofar as all war might be called that. Uh, whereas uh, uh, wars in other places uh, uh, have apparently been virtually unrestrained by uh, any regard for what's commonly called the laws of war, treatment of prisoners, treatment of occupied populations, and so forth. Of course, the answer to your question must be yes, that uh, if Nuremberg is to have any value, one must keep it in mind as one scrutinizes uh, uh, hostilities and warfare that comes in later years. Uh, and uh, of course, with the Vietnam War, it was our job to do that because we were the ones that were involved in that. Uh, interestingly enough, there was relatively little, relatively little talk about that during the Korean War. Uh, but, but, you know, this would spin me out into a long answer, and I know that's getting late, and I don't want to go into all the details. The answer to your question is yes, uh, that, that, of course, if Nuremberg is regarded as a principled thing, uh, it can't be just, uh, just a ding on zick. It can't be just that thing. It's got to be a principle that applies elsewhere, too. Uh, I suppose in doing that, one must uh, take account of uh, tradition and history and peoples that have more of a tradition of... Uh, associating warfare with certain limited aims, 
uh, people who don't regard death as anything so very bad have other views about it and other practices in warfare. These are realities one must reckon with, but you can't just throw up your hands and say Nuremberg was just that and it doesn't matter anywhere else. Well, on that note of uh, leaving us to meditate on responsibility, I'd like to thank you all for coming, but especially thank you, Telford Taylor. Thank you.